Hi everyone, it's John. It is not Tuesday for once. I was um, busy yesterday, but I had a review all prepared and just got distracted. But I thought the first thing on Wednesday morning I will upload my review and hopefully uh, keep everyone happy. Um, I want to talk about a review. I want to talk about a book and review a book that I read a few weeks ago. I came across it just perusing the clearance section of a, a book sale online some time back and had heard of the author's name and was always curious about the title because intellectual history is one of my interests. This is The Reckless Mind, Intellectuals and Politics by Mark Lilla. The first half of the 20th century produced a lot of continental European philosophers who openly criticized de facto bourgeois liberalism and the governments that their countries were associated with. Democracy, republicanism, etc. Capitalism. So in this book, in which Mark Lilla paints these short intellectual vignettes of some of these thinkers, he really had uh, no shortage from which to choose. To be more specific, this is a series of portraits of thinkers who flirted with political thought that can sometimes be perceived as dangerous or reactionary. His choices to me seem to be pretty standard. Uh, they are Heidegger, Hannah Arendt and Karl Jaspers, all considered together in the opening chapter. Karl Schmidt, uh, Walter Benjamin, Alexander Khojev, uh, Aller, uh, Aller, uh, uh, Foucault, whose first name I momentarily forgot, um, but and uh, Jacques Derrida. Um, so it's these it's this group of thinkers that. I mean, I guess we don't always think about Foucault as being a, a dangerous or radical thinker, but, but some of these people, uh, especially Carl Schmitt and Heidegger, I think probably have the worst reputations these days. The, the popular, I guess, though, obviously flawed image of the public intellectual would have it that he or she is a person who is able to apprise us of dangers, political trends, pitfalls that we might see coming down the pike with regard to uh, our culture or our government. Their engagement in abstract thinking and liberal ideas of you know, critical inquiry, many people seem to assume, endow them with the intellectual gifts that can allow them to, to serve as cultural horospects carefully divining our futures from looking at the shape of the smoke cast off by the fat of the burning bowl. We seem disappointed then to learn that these intellectuals are really nothing more than human beings who are capable or maybe even prone to the same logical fallacies, groupthink, and ideological myopia that we are. As far as the content of the book goes, uh, many people, I'm not going to talk about each of the, the people he talks about that would get a little repetitive and make the review overly long. I'll just mention a couple of them in passing. I think many people are probably already familiar with the story of Hannah Arendt and Martin Heidegger. Uh, it's, it's a it's a love story, an affair that's received uh, almost as much popular attention as the one between Simone de Beauvoir and Jean Paul Sartre. But fewer people might be familiar with the role of uh, Karl Jaspers, uh, spelled J A S P E R S. It looks like Jaspers in English, but he was German, so it's pronounced Jaspers. Uh, Jaspers who himself in his in his own right is very much a philosopher worth studying uh, a bit of a psychologist an existentialist um 
you know how all of those fields sort of mixed up in in the first uh, third of the German 20th century or so. Kaspers continually tried to warn Heidegger about his flirtations with Nazism. Kaspers himself had a Jewish wife, so he had good reason. He had good reason before, but he had especially good reason to be disgusted with Heidegger's political behavior and inclinations. But Heidegger's long-standing refusal to apologize for his own actions and his affiliation with the Nazi party led both him and Hannah Arendt to conclude somewhat paradox paradoxically that while he was a colossus of early 20th century European thought, his ideas about where praxis-driven, practical, where the rubber meets the road politics could no longer be taken seriously. Alexander Kozhev and Karl Schmidt, uh, both of whom had sizable influence on the course of Western thought, but themselves are not really read, as far as I know, unless you're maybe doing a, a course in Western intellectual history or something. Uh, each get their own chapter. So Alexandra uh, uh, Alexandre Kozhev uh, had an affinity for mysticism and radical politics. In a in in an important series of lectures given during the 1930s, he was the guy who basically single-handedly introduced a lot of political thinkers, political philosophers, and otherwise intellectuals to the ideas of Hegel. Not only reintroduced people to Hegel, but he also did a critical interpretation of Hegel himself. So, just to list you some of the names of the people who were in attendance, uh, they would be people like Georges Bataille, uh, Vey, Eric, the philosopher not Simone, uh, Maurice Melo-Ponty, uh, Jacques Lacan, and Raymond Aron. Schmidt was uh, a vehement critic of the Weimar Republic. I'm talking about Karl Schmidt. Uh, Schmidt is uh, S-C-H-M-I-T-T, -T, by the way. All of this can be found uh, below in the link to my written review, so if you have any questions about spellings or names or looking up some of the books that these people wrote, you can um, look there. All of this is posted on Goodreads. Uh, Schmidt was a, a vehement critic of the Weimar Republic, an adamant national socialist, and is maybe today best known for being the Nazis' most recognized jurist and uh, renowned political philosopher. I think the saving grace of the book, which otherwise seems to be little more than a loosely tied together series of lives lived in the liminal spaces of ideology, of ideology and philosophy, is the final chapter where Mark Lilla speculates that intellectuals need to hone that special kind of self-discipline that allows them to recognize and manipulate abstract concepts while at the same time realizing that the world doesn't always conform to them. He makes an important observation about some of the interests of the people he discusses. He says that many of them write about and are heavily concerned with spiritualism, with spirituality with and especially obscurantist forms of spirituality and mysticism they seem to be invested in overthrowing what they deem to be a lost overly materialistic secular world that comes through especially in people like uh, Gershom Shalom's influence on Walter Benjamin uh, much like religion can serve as an antidote for this kind of nostalgia for the past or for a different kind of worldview, so too can radical politics, as we see in this book. 
Drawing upon Plato's idea of the philosopher king, Mark Lula explains that we need to cultivate and balance our inner lives before we can hope to exert influence on the outer world. And I'm sure Karl Popper would be rolling in his grave at the irony of needing to import Plato into a discussion warning us of the dangers of tyranny. <laughs> um, Lilla's lack of Socratic irony throughout the book is a little... Well, it leaves, it leaves something to be desired. He never really seems to be able to zoom out and do a panoramic view of 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 the people he's considering and and he's never able to realize that he himself seems to be deeply engaged in a construction of his own utopia simply by virtue of the fact of the people of the ideas of the people that he's criticizing his own utopia which looks a lot like you know assuming the inherent truth of enlightenment era Democratic, lowercase d, Republican, lowercase r, political values, capitalist as well, capitalist socialist, democratic socialist. Uh, granted, this is an admission that takes a lot of intellectual humility, uh, especially appended to the end of a book that was just spent excoriating intellectuals and their uh, penchant for utopia building. But I would have liked to have seen a bit more of that humility and Maybe his his quite unnoticed or unmentioned biases himself. Not to say that those biases are wrong, but simply that we we have our own, and for whatever reason we may consider them to be less dangerous than others. But he doesn't really uh, give that much consideration, and I would have love to see that since there was plenty of room in the book for it. If you, uh, Mark Lilla has written one or two other books along these same lines. He is uh, mostly interested in the French intellectual history of the 20th century. He's done um, a book on the f uh, French critical theory, uh, French um, sort of postmodern thought, I think. But uh, if you're familiar with this book, or uh, anything else by Lil, or the writers that he talks about inside, let me know. Drop me a comment, and we'll talk about it. This is The Reckless Mind, Intellectuals and in Politics, by Mark Lua. I will see you next Tuesday. Bye.